like to call to order the Winthrop Town Council meeting for April 4th, 2023. We are in the Harvey hearing room. And roll call, please. Council Honan. Here. Council Pisillo. Council Munson. Here. Council Belcher. Here. Council DeMarco. Here. Council Blockhart. Here. Council Aiello. Here. Vice President Ruggiero. Here. President Letary. Here. And Thank before you. we stand, I'll just say the Zoom, which I forgot to say earlier. If you want to participate on Zoom, the phone number is 1 305 224 1968. And the ID is 841 4587 0668. Please rise for the pledge. Councilor DeMarco. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing for. On March 27th, the horror and terror of yet another school shooting, this time at the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, left six innocent people dead, three adults, including a custodian, substitute teacher, and the headmaster, along with three young children who lost their lives. I'm asking for a moment of silence. And uh, before we go on to minutes, I have asked, uh, because of just the violence going on in the school shooting in particular, not this one in particular, but just in general, um, I've, I've gotten phone calls just to wanting updates on security in our town facilities. And, um, and, I, and I thank the superintendent for being here, too. And um, Lisa takes her role incredibly seriously. Obviously, educating our kids is foremost at the forefront, but providing safety for our kids is also um, something she thinks about constantly. And I just asked uh, the police chief to come down and, you know, there's only so much we could share in a public setting, but just to give us a little overview on security. Sure. Chief and Lisa, superintendent. So thank you, uh, Mr. President and counselors, for the opportunity to join you once again. Town Manager Marino, uh, thank you for your continued support. Um, so I guess we can say that um, we've been working on school security since I've been the police chief um, and much of the upgrades that we've received has been through the generosity of Speaker DeLeo um, with the Juvenile and Youth Safety Grants. We've made incredible and remarkable uh, progress. Uh, back in 2012, we had the IACP and the International Associated Chiefs of Police through the Department of Justice uh, granted us a school assessment and survey. Um, in 2014, they came back to reassess us and we made all of the, they told us they gave us a five year plan. They were very impressed that we have made all the upgrades that they recommended within a three year period uh, instead of a five year period. So um, again, every year um, come August, we go through the schools with a checklist. Um, the superintendent gets a report from me, um, Chief Wiley, uh, the building commissioner who's on, who's there as well doing the inspections with us. So we have a whole team of school resource officer. Every phone is checked, every camera is checked. Um, Detective Wayne Carter runs the camera systems for the entire town, including um, assisting with the school's uh, security cameras as well. So we know in live time if one is down, uh, they're immediately fixed, they're on the priority list. Um, you know, school, a school camera goes down, uh, that's fixed that same day. Uh, we have a vendor called Lantel, uh, which is contracted to the Homeland Security at UAC in Boston. Uh, they're on the state contract list and they do our cameras as well. Um, because a lot of our cameras are connected to the infrastructure of nine other communities. Um, but again, you know, as you said, uh, alluded to at the beginning, um, we can't get into the specific details of where these devices are, how many we have, what buildings they're on, or uh, other security measures that we have in place would defeat the purpose in a public session um, to go into that. I can tell you that uh, Lisa has been worked uh, many years on the threat assessment team. I joined her on that team, as well as the school psychologist, um, <clears throat> the multiple people, uh, administrators. multiple administrators, Scott Wiley from the fire department, Chief Wiley from the fire department, 
And if we have a, a potential threat or we hear rumblings of a threat, we convene the threat assessment team as a checklist to go through. We're also members of the NUMLEC, uh, Northeast Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council. The primary reason for joining NUMLEC uh, was their STARS program. The STARS program gets activated on any type of threat to a school. Um, they combined with police officers, school therapists, uh, social workers, principals, and superintendents that deploy to your school to assist the superintendent, the administrators in that school for whatever the crisis may be. Uh, it's a huge uh, multiplier for us where if we need multiple um, disciplinaries, we call one number, the whole team is deployed. Um, with them comes specialized equipment as well, including metal detectors if we ever needed them. Um, they can install them within 15 minutes. Uh, they bring them with them uh, in a trailer that's um, stored in another community. So we have access to all of these uh, great features by being a member, it costs us $2,400 a year. Uh, to be a member, we also have team with the police officers that join the team. Rob Carter is a school resource officer on the STARS program. Sean Perrin's on the motorcycle program. Dave Brown was on the K-9 program until we retired our K-9. So we have to contribute resources as well. Um, and again, just as a reminder, um, we had an unfortunate active shooter event here in the community you know, now almost two years ago. Um, NUMLEC um, deployed their, their whole um, strategic team, including motorcycles and SWAT offices and command posts and everything to relieve the Boston police and allow the Boston police to return to Boston. So NUMLEC is not just there in the STARS program, but there as well for other uh, tragedies and, and emergencies within the town. The NUMLEC team was all deployed up in the Lawrence and Andover area uh, when the gas explosions were there and they were there for weeks. Um, so they're not just some people that come and leave uh, when the cameras go away, they stay and support the community. Um, so I will allow yeah, the superintendent sure. um, an opportunity to fill in the blanks where I left off. Sure, where I sure. Left off. So um, as probably most of you have spoken to me, uh, are aware of security and the safety of our students and our staff and our community is the number one priority of the Winter Public Schools. There is nothing that is above that. Um, our working relationship with the police department, fire department, and um, other town agencies like the DPW are critical uh, in terms of our success management and funding of the number of things that we do with our schools. Uh, we can't really separate any of the departments from the school department. Uh, one, we need them all uh, to, to help us, and two, there's not enough funding in the world uh, for us to have something so secure that nobody can do anything to us. Um, we are well aware of that. So there is no uh, full safety. We are watching it every single day. Other things that we put uh, into the school system with the assistance of uh, the police department and, and other departments, uh, we have some social networking tracking that we do through Social Sentinel, which is an alert system um, that lets us know if people are tweeting, Instagramming, or posting. Um, negative comments about the school, we get that alert. Um, and uh, thankfully, not frequently, but when we do get it, the first uh, call is between the chief and myself uh, to look up who these people are, what they're saying, is this a potential threat, and what, what are we going to do next? Um, some of the internal controls that we have, uh, our staff are all Alice trained, which is a, an alert training. If there is an active shooter or somebody in our school comes into our school that is a threat, uh, teachers in every building are trained. Um, that's a condition of our work employment now here. Um, we have a majority of our staff that are trained in Stop the Bleed, thankfully with the collaboration of the Town Health Department, Police, Fire, uh, and Action Ambulance. Uh, that would be if somebody was bleeding, uh, whether it be from um, somebody coming into one of our schools and hurting someone or is someone in the cafeteria uh, who hurts themselves uh, accidentally with a knife. So staff has been trained on that. Many members have been trained in CPR, again, with the collaboration uh, of the school and the other town departments. Um, we have emergency plans are current that are updated. All of these are updated every single year and in between if we need to. Emergency plans, evacuation plans. Um, our student um, threat assessment team works not only for outside threats, but also on occasion, there may be an inside threat, a student who may have suicidal or homicidal ideations, a, stu a student that is uh, potentially making threats to another student um, or a member of the staff. 
Uh, we have internal staff that runs through a smaller version of what we do in, a, in an outside threat assessment, um, and that includes evaluation of students and connections to agencies within the, within the state uh, that can come out and, and help us with a student who may be uh, having a very difficult time. Um, the student, we also do um, now a, a student social emotional um, check in with all of our students, K through 12, uh, where we collect data on our students three times a year. We put that in place um, for a number of reasons. Uh, COVID um, certainly has left us many good things, but has left us some things that have been difficult for us with the emotional changes in some of our, um, some of our students. So this system is a check in three times a year that allows us to keep this data electronically and to be able to share it as students move from grade to grade. And the purpose of um, keeping that data is to not lose kids from year to year and not allow children to fall through the cracks and also to help us figure out what have we done, what has worked and what hasn't. Um, and as students escalate uh, up that ladder, it allows us to identify more uh, things to put in place for, for our kids uh, to help them along the way. Our staff has many trainings, one of them that's critical um, signs of suicide, so that um, our staff members are aware of the commentary that students may be making um, and be able to alert the people that are on our internal threat assessment team uh, to intervene and, and help with those students. Um, the upgrades in our school um, oftentimes happen throughout the year, but the key is our yearly police, uh, fire, and DPW assessment of our school buildings. Um, there's many things that we may not notice that the police and the fire would, and some of them are, are very simple. Um, they may have to do with a broken door lock, um, keys that don't work in a certain door, something with the elevator, um, maybe storage in a hallway that shouldn't be there because it could cause a fire or could block, um, you know, if we need assistance, could block that doorway. Um, so when they come out each year, that is taken extremely seriously. Um, my, my principals actually get very nervous on that day because they know what's in front of them. I want to um, just make sure people understand that this is not a normal practice in every public school, um, that yearly the police, fire, and, and community come out and look at your school buildings and give you a very comprehensive, thanks to Terry's writing, which is comprehensive, um, checklist and, and uh, itemized um, list of things that we need to do. And it doesn't stop there because as Terry is maybe worse than me in terms of follow-up, um, checks in with us to make sure that we're making those improvements. Um, some of our grants that we have, uh, as school security grants, safety grants that we apply for, we utilize that money uh, for the most part to take care of those needed changes in our schools. Um, Terry spoke about Lantel, um, which is a um, homeland offshoot of homeland security systems. Um, Lantel has been a, a key player um, in the security systems that we have, the cameras that we have within our schools. Um, we can call them and they can be out here within an hour uh, looking at a camera that's in a key space in our schools or on Miller Field or outside of our schools, wherever those cameras may be. Um, and another feature is that um, key yeah. administrators uh, can log into oh, those no. cameras. Oh, Kathleen might oh. want mute herself. So, um, so those are, those are just some of the things. I understand um, as the superintendent, you know, in my role, but more importantly, um, in my role as a mother of a yeah. child who is still in the school system, Terry still has kids in the school system. I think that's probably a heightened benefit to the community of Winthrop. Um, I, I was super uh, intent on security when my well, kids no, were little and just starting school. school. But now, I'm so sorry, it's not allowing me to mute. Them. Yeah, now, now more importantly, um, just cut them off. The, the focus of, of security here, um, it, it goes beyond the walls of a title that either one of us hold. It is very personal. Um, I understand as a parent that it can be frustrating that you don't know because as parents, we want to know well, what are your security systems? Tell me what you do to make me feel better. Um, and I understand that as a, as a mom, and I'm sure Terry does as a dad, but as somebody who is responsible for 2,000 students and over 350 employees every day, um, if we tell people what our security systems are and what our plans <coughs> are, they're no longer safe. Because in this world, we cannot trust people. 
Um, and we do change our plans often to eliminate anybody really ever finding out about how we do keep our kids as safe as we do. So it's, I think it's hard for people to, to trust us that we are keeping our kids safe um, without us telling them the details. I would just ask uh, if for people to trust that. Um, our process is ongoing every single day we're dealing with safety and security issues in the school. So I hope that information is helpful. I could probably talk for two hours. My voice will not let me talk for another two minutes. So but I'm happy to answer. No, it's, it's, it's very helpful. And you know, no individual, no municipality is infallible. But I, I, we just want the residents to know that we take security incredibly seriously in our town. And, and like the superintendent says, you know, it can't maybe be said for every municipality in the state. But we, uh, public safety officials, our school department, our town departments, uh, take this extremely seriously and, and we understand that there's only so much you could tell and, and I'm happy for that because I shouldn't know and, and there are people out there that shouldn't know but um, it, it just it there's a feeling of comfort you know you're dealing with our most precious assets right your kids and there's a feeling of comfort to know the dedication and caring that you two take and, and I thank you for that and I'll open it up to any counselors has any questions or comments uh, Vice President Ruggiero. I have a question, but just a comment. Um, obviously, it's unfortunate that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're at the point in, you know, our lives and in our nation's history that we have to talk about this. But thank you for coming in and, um, you know, addressing this. I don't think we've really had an update like this, in, in, at least in my time here, on, on specifically school security and school safety. So just thank you for everything that you do. Um, you know, sometimes people ask, like, oh, you know, would you, would you allow your kids to do that, or would you send your kids there? Or, and the answer is yes, like you both would, and you both do. And I think that's, um, uh, you know, it makes me feel pretty, pretty good about um, the way we're handling things at the school. So thank you both. It doesn't mean we don't have a pit in our stomach. <laughs> yeah. When these unfortunate events take place, they, they resonate, you know, a lot of fear and sadness for people, and we are not exempt from that. Um, but I do feel very confident in our day-to-day -day management of the school safety and I, I do know that it is extremely annoying to parents that we do not allow parents or anybody to come into our schools. Um, prior to COVID it was a little bit more loose. Uh, COVID we didn't let you in because we didn't want your COVIDness, <laughs> for lack of better terms. Um, but we found that that gave us as a school district one more level of security um, so when people dismiss their children, you'll find that they have to wait outside. And I know it's cold and I know it's wet um, sometimes. And I know it's annoying sometimes. Uh, but if you dress right, it's usually only a few minutes. Um, but it's, it's definitely another level of security for us. I just think the most important thing to remember, that as long as we have human beings, there's going to be human error someplace. And we, and we have to drill for that. We have to train for that. And... We have to assure that the staff and the police officers are all doing their jobs on a daily basis so there is no human error. Uh, but, you know, they say that we're going to be 100%. And when, when, you have, when you factor in human errors, um, not, you can't say anything's 100%. I'm going I'm to say I'm very comfortable sending my daughters to school every single day. Um, I rest comfortably knowing they're in school every single day. And I don't... You know, there's a run, hide, fight out there. There's an Alice. Um, there's a Lurch. Uh, no matter what you call it, it all boils down to the same thing. It really is a run, hide, fight um, program, no matter what you call it. Now, the state is adopting the NFPA 3000, which is the National Firefighters, uh, Professional Firefighters Association, a 3000 standard. That's a state standard that police, fire, and EMS have to uh, meet within the next year. So we've already worked on that. I'm already trained in ALERT. Um, the ALERT at the University of Texas is training um, train the trainers in Massachusetts. We will be sending train the trainers and then we will drill with police, fire, and EMS on how we respond. So we're good inside the school. <clears throat> we've been doing what they call ASHA training, which is a multidisciplinary response. Who's coming into the warm zone? Who's staying out in the cold zone? And then who's going after? Um, the person inside the building. So that, that's now the, the latest training that's coming. We'll have it here in Winthrop as well. We'll train every shift. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we never need it. 
Uh, but the, you know, basically what we did is we, we took the planning and the efforts that we've done with the school and plopped them in the middle of Shirley Street and took 2021. And it worked out well. The response time was quick. We isolated the incident quickly. It was unfortunate we lost two people during that day. Uh, but then we had reunification and we had mental health follow-up and community uh, mental health um, follow-up through public health. I've gotten more calls based on our response to that event saying, how did you figure that out so quickly? And who implemented it? So it was easy because we've been working since 2013 with Meredith Thurley's office. Mm -hmm. So we had this already planned for the schools and we were able to just transfer it. Um, so it's a benefit that all the training we've done um, has benefited, will benefit the whole community no matter where it is. And hopefully we're gonna have another right. incident and, like that. And with that incident too, I think the community may or may not know, with it being the community that it is, Recording students or children were affected by that as well, whether they saw something on TV, whether they saw something in reality, whether they heard something. Um, so the, the other aspect of the training that Terry has gone through that we've then implemented in the schools was the reaction of who was showing up at the table. So after the incident was um, dealt with on an on a emergency basis by the police, the follow-up didn't just go to the people on Shirley Street um, and those that reached out, it went as into the schools because all of our children were affected. And that is because of the relationships that we have and the work that we do together uh, as a community. So we are not separate in any way, um, but we're trained at different levels. And I think the training of our staff um, in schools and, and our children, when I say we're training children, our children are trained to listen to the adult who's in charge of them. And the staff training has been um, difficult because it's hard to practice these drills because it's scary to think that it could happen here. But I think it's the most important takeaway from all of that with our staff, that it, it is better to know what to do and, and have a chance of survival than not know what to do and likely not survive. And so that is why we put so much time and, <clears throat> and effort into it, as scary as it is for families and for our students. So. And, and we have the public health department with us when we drill. So we have the counselors with us in case we trigger any uh, negative emotions. There's a room that they can go into and counselors are there on scene to deal with that. Because you don't know who's been through what in their lifetime. And we, we want to have support there for them if it does trigger something. So I, I'll leave you on this. I know budget time is near. <laughs> it's quickly approaching. Um, when you're looking at town buildings and you're looking at schools, um, you know, take a good long look at building maintenance money because that equals security. It allows us to fix a door, to fix the locks, um, to do the smaller things that we need to do to make sure that build, all buildings are secure, not just the schools. Um, so I, you know, I just urge, um, I, know, I know the town manager has that philosophy as well and um, I think we're in good hands um, this budget season, but I just want to remind everyone that during the budget season, Building maintenance money is, a great, is is very important to us. Honestly. Just a couple of Security. quick questions left. Council Munson, and then Council Flockhart. Thank you. We've been fortunate to have a lot of shared parenting moments with kids in the same age, and I'm thankful for both of you and for the whole talent wide to make it a safe place for them. I'm, I've been very comfortable bringing my kids to your schools and, and to your schools, and and it feels very safe. So I'm I'm very thankful. I wanted to just show my appreciation. Um, I also wanted to just point, uh, just ask more of a comment. Maybe you don't have to respond here, but I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're doing three times a year to, to keep a, an eye on their emotional, social kind of well-being and kind of create that track record. My concern sometimes is the quiet one that just stays off the radar and they don't actually say anything until they go pop. And so I just wonder if there's also on the other end of the spectrum, not the loud ones, the brash ones, or the troublemakers, but the ones that don't speak enough or don't have any interaction with anyone. I worry about those people being lost in the shuffle. Right, so that's a great, that's a great question. And the easy answer to that is the assessments that we do assess every child and they pinpoint changes in behavior. And because that is something that, you know, statistically we have found and, and research has found that changes in behavior for somebody who has committed some type of a horrific event, you can track backwards and see those changes in behavior. And that's the main reason that we implemented 
this type of evaluation of students. And you know, a lot of it is a self, the majority of it is the student self-evaluating and us taking that commentary and then the teachers also evaluating the, the child based on their self-evaluation. So it's able to track those pieces of data and, and the most important thing is to store those pieces of data and to review them consistently so we can find the child who was an active child playing sports, maybe involved in extra clubs, and all of a sudden next school year comes back in a hoodie, maybe not really talking too much, um, maybe saying some things that they wouldn't have said last year. We can look at last year's data or last semester's data to say, why is that change happening? And how, and how can we intervene? and then carry forward to make sure that we do make progress with that child. And if not, we have multiple agencies um, that we can bring forth for our parents you know, to support that in school and out of school. So that's a really good point. It's a, it was a missing link you know, in terms of being able to track kids. Very good. Council Flockhart. Um, I'm uh, very impressed with the uh, systems that you have in place, the multiple layers, uh, and that you're approaching um, finding things in advance, which seems to be the missing uh, point in a lot of these problems. Um, I did want to ask, in this training that you're doing, where you said that or the Department of Health was involved in all, are the children involved in this training too? So we train the staff. The st staff brings it back to the age appropriate level of their children. Um, they're the ones that will be led. The best fit to choose how to present that we have bought books um, that have been distributed throughout the schools on um, how to approach it on, on an age-based uh, level. And they can simply read the book and it has instructions in it um, for the staff member to follow. So we're trying to support the staff as well um, as far as how to explain it. But we didn't, um, I think it would be more traumatizing for a police officer to walk in the room and say, hey, this is what we're going to do, right? So we try to have the professionals who deal with them every day because ultimately they're going to have to follow those professionals. They're going to do, almost like a fire drill. Just do what I say when it's time to do it, right? Yeah. Um, Very similar to what we do on a fire drill, um, how we are an evacuation drill, whatever it may be. But I think important to Terry's point, it's age appropriate. Um, so what, the, what kids are learning in kindergarten and first grade is a bit different than what the other students are learning. We have some work to do on that in terms of um, the social emotional well-being of our kids and presenting something like an active shooter training to high school students. Um, we're, we're, we're feeling very confident that our kids will listen to our staff members and do what they're asked to do. Um, our next level would be to start to gauge what kids could handle something at a, at a higher level um, for training. And that's, you gotta deal with the emotional side of the kids too. Having lived through the 50s, and the bomb drills that we got climbing under desks and all this nonsense that we went through, I assure you, it, the only thing it did was give us all nightmares. It was very traumatizing. Our kids are pretty good about doing what we tell them to do in the moment and focusing in on a trusted adult. We do a lot of building of trust relationships with our kids. It's a main priority to get to know kids and build some trusting relationships with them so that when we say it's time to listen, they do. And we practice time to listen a lot. It sounds like you've got a good handle on it. Thank you. Councilor DeMarco? Yeah, I just um, wanted to say that, I mean, Lisa Howard has been part of the school system for at least 32 years, well, off and on. Like 50, 49. <laughs> oh, you're not I that old. Know. Stop. Well, school year, too. Don't forget. <laughs> um, I personally couldn't feel more safe with my kids from a safety perspective under your supervision. So I yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming. It's uh, very much appreciated. Uh, thank thank really you for your support. I'd just be yeah. remiss if I didn't thank my staff. I get, the, I get the opportunity to come here and present to you, and, and they do the work. So I just want to make sure I thank them. Thank you. Thank Same you. for the school district. Good night. As well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> There are minutes circulated from the April 21st meeting. <coughs> Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Motion by Councillor Belcher, second by Councillor Flockhart. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those no, the ayes have it. General information recommendations, we do not have anything. Public hearings, we have none tonight. Public comment. Um, 
In the audience? Yes. Todd Sacco, Precinct 2. Um, I had the, the opportunity to read the proposed lag policy, which I believe is going to be voted on or at least discussed tonight. Um, I would thank everybody on the Rules and Ordinance Committee for their time. This is actually fairly uh, innocuous, um, but there are some concerns, at least from my end, maybe confusion. Uh, I'm not sure how. You have kind of two masters, so I'd encourage you to kind of reconsider that. Like you have either the town council or the town manager get to have this proclamation. It's not clear how that works. Um, I'm concerned about the whole sentiment piece. Sentiment comes down to how do you have a whole town sentiment? I don't know that you will have that um, when you're deciding on which flags to fly. And I, I was also asked to come here and read a letter into the record uh, from Brianna Malloy and her wife, Brianna Malloy and her wife Sarah, because they couldn't make it tonight because uh, they have some concerns as well. Uh, let's address the most concerning line of this proposal. Flags may be displayed on the community flagpole at the E.V. Newton School by the town as an expression of the town's official sentiments. The word sentiment is defined as an attitude towards something, a bias, a mental feeling, an opinion, etc. The town council and town manager do not and should not have the authority to make decisions based on sentiments for the Winthrop residents. When the flag policy is brought up, it is usually followed by requesting the gay pride flag to <coughs> be flown, especially as Gay Pride Month is approaching in June. We are a lesbian married couple of Winthrop. Uh, by the way, they're in the LGBT community. Um, that's, they wanted me to make that distinction. However, we openly stand against flying the pride flag on all town-owned flagpoles for a few reasons. As stated above, this opens the door for a free-for-all to fly any flag based on feelings and opinions. Residents and businesses in our town are strongly encouraged to fly the flags that represent their beliefs and what they are proud of. It just doesn't belong on town property as a platform to divide citizens. Let us keep flying our U.S. flag and POW MIA flag, which unites us all, and there is nothing at all divisive about it. Also, in regard to specifically flying the rainbow pride flag, it's important to be educated that our pride, pride flag has drastically changed since 2018. There is the original eight-color rainbow flag, which was created in 1978 by a gay artist and Vietnam veteran, and it is rarely flown these days. Unfortunately, this flag change has divided the LGBT community, so flying the progressive pride flag can be contentious. This is something important for all to be aware of, and we felt compelled to express our strong opinion on changing the flag policy. Sincerely, Sarah and Brianna Malloy of District 6. Thank you. Any other public comments? Anything on Zoom? No hands, no. All right. <clears throat> Correspondence, Denise? I have received none. Any councils? All right. Committee reports. Finance committee. Uh, uh, Councilor Belcher. Thank you. The finance committee met this evening before this meeting. It was myself and Councilor Ruggiero. There was one motion that we went over about m moving funds from the legal services line to the personnel line. This is mostly administrative to shift the funds from the line that we use to pay KP law into a personnel line so we can pay the town's in-house counsel through the end of this fiscal year. All right. And that will come up in old business. Uh, rules and Ordinance, Vice President Majewa. Thank you, Council President. Um, the Rules and Ordinance Subcommittee met on the 29th of March. Um, we took up two items, three motions total. The first, uh, in, in attendance for myself, Councilors DeMarco and Munson from the committee and Councilor Belcher as a uh, ex officio member. Um, the first issue we took up was the um, pair of motions that was presented to the council at our last meeting related to the composition of the Board of Appeals. Um, the first motion that we discussed um, in, would increase the size of the Board of Appeals, so it would require us to appoint additional members to that. Uh, the second motion, coupled with that, um, would adopt Mass General Law Chapter 39, Section 23, which would allow um, the associate members of the Board of Appeals to step in and vote for an absent member, a regular voting member of the Board of Appeals, um, if that person were to be absent on the day of a vote, provided 
that they had missed no more than one meeting during the hearing process and that they attest in writing that they uh, were of aware of all of the facts and provisions and that they watched a recording of the meeting that they missed. Um, in our opinion, this would make for a more efficient process. It would um, expedite, um, expedite might not be the right word, but it, it would create a more efficient government. Um, we, the general consensus that we were in favor of these, um, we had a few follow-up questions that we uh, sent to Attorney Cipolletta, which we received answers on, and we're really thankful for that quick response. So I, I think our concerns were clarified in committee, but we decided to hold these um, until our next council meeting just because we haven't heard back from members of the Board of Appeals directly yet. We want to make sure that we give them ample time to uh, consider these and get back to us with any opinions or thoughts that they may have before we take a vote. Um, this is the adjudicatory body of the town, so we want to make sure that um, before we change anything with their, their workflow or their composition that, you know, we have um, their buy-in. Um, because that is a tough committee to sit on, as we all know. Um, so we want to just make sure that we're all on board here. But I do expect that um, at our next council meeting, we will have a recommendation to be voted on. So if any um, public hearings need to be posted to change the ordinance, um, I request that we do so. Yep. Um, the second policy, or the second issue that we took up was the flag policy. This is something that the council's been talking about for years now. Um, this was neither a rule nor an ordinance, but it was referred to our committee um, for, for further discussion. Um, we were presented with this policy um, from the town manager. The town manager had reviewed this with uh, in-house counsel um, and compared it to um, what's out in the, uh, in, in the space, in, in the space of government these days um, to make sure that this passes muster with the uh, the recent Supreme Court hearing and, you know, finalization of that, the city of Boston case. So um, that motion, well, that policy was moved forward um, unanimously and uh, it is in your agenda packages for consideration this evening. <coughs> Thank you very much. Is there a question? I yes, Councilor Ayala. Um, there had been a related on route on the, <clears throat> the Board of Appeals issues, there had been a related proposed ordinance change, I, I may have missed something about uh, change of use uh, restriction. Is that uh, still in committee? Uh, what's the status of that? That's not technically with rules and order. Uh, that rules and ordinance, that's... That's part of the um, ordinance review committee's recommendations and we're going through uh, our in-house attorney to get, to get some more <laughs> clarification on a couple of those items, including okay. um, you know, including um, the variant, the transient lodging and yeah, Airbnb sure. and such. Okay. Can we try to schedule that soon? Yes, we uh, hope to get that. So we, we think, you know, we think the Airbnb ordinance and transient lodging is going to be a little extended. I think it's going to take some time to get it, to get it correct. And the, uh, I think we should be able to hear back in a, in a sooner period in terms of the use variance. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, the Airbnb ordinance as well. It's incredibly, incredibly important. Fast track that. Yes. Um, it's sort of running rampant these days. So the faster we can go, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, school department met a week ago Monday. Um, <coughs> major topic of discussion was uh, the good news that the contractual situation with the ESPs has been settled. Um, so we discussed that. Also on discussion again was the budget and the fact that the school committee will be voting on a uh, recommended budget from them uh, in, in a subsequent meeting in April. Um, so they look for your input, parents and citizens alike. If you have any input on the school <coughs> department budget or any thoughts, they would appreciate the comments. Town Manager's Report. Thank you, Mr. Council President. Um, on the topic of the uh, flag policy, the uh, flag poles are scheduled to be installed at the uh, before the end of April. So the three flag pole system we've been referring to at the E.B. Newton building will be installed. Um, I was actually drove up Friday to take a look at the ferry boat, um, check a look at the new engines on last Friday up in Newburyport. Um, everything's on track. We need to, uh, a little bit more wiring they were working on, and then they have to schedule the sea trials, they call it, with uh, uh, Cummins Engines, the company that supplied the two new engines. So uh, that'll be happening hopefully 
next week, but the mechanic that was working on it was on vacation last week. He's back tonight, so I'll be talking to him tomorrow to find out when that's going to get scheduled. So, um, But we're happy about the work that was done, and the, the ferry looked good. It's in the water. It's still float. It's all good. But uh, <laughs> after that, uh, with all the new engines, it's good, and we're going to get it down to the next step after that. Once we certify the boat and everything with uh, the new engines, then we have to get it down to uh, either Boston or Gloucester to have the Coast Guard inspection done. We're in the every other year cycle, so this is the year we have to pull the boat out of the water and do a hull inspection. So we just got to get that coordinated and scheduled. So uh, we were hoping for the 15th of April. I don't know if we'll make that date, but hopefully before the end of the month um, we can get it in the water. But that's the uh, we're we're pushing hard. So I'll go give updates as I get them. But we're still waiting on uh, scheduling the um, with the uh, reps from the uh, Cummins. So. Um, it's been full steam ahead on the budget. Uh, that's where most of my time is right now. Putting, uh, you know, anytime you introduce a new budget style and format, you know, there's a lot of work and making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So we're doing that, making sure all the numbers tick and talk back to the, you know, the main book document and all the uh, expenses and revenues match up. So we're working on that diligently with um, the finance team. Uh, also uh, met with and working with the local veterans groups and our VSO, uh, talking about Memorial Day. Uh, they've got an event planned for Flag Day. Um, and Memorial Day will be slightly different. We'll start at the cemetery like we always do, uh, but then there'll be a brief walk up back to Town Hall for a small ceremony after that. Um, so keep that. M more to follow on that, but that's what the plan is right now. Um, we did get all the letters out um, in a timely fashion for the uh, Revere Street Tips Project for the easements, the, both the temporary easements and the permanent easements. Uh, we've been getting phone calls. I've been fielding probably three or four a day, just people clarification on what it is and you know how the process is going to go. Uh, they've got to hold those letters for 30 days and then we'll work on that. We'll be back for initial votes with the council as we move forward with what they call the takings. Um, and then we wrap that up and we're still on track though to put the project out to bid in June, which is a crucial piece with Mass DOT. So we stay on target for start this work next spring, summer. So, um, uh, union negotiations going well. We still got the, you know, the superior union and the, uh, patrolman and sergeants union for the police. We're making good progress on that. And uh, trees related, we actually, uh, Steve Calla and I and um, uh, our tree warden uh, went down and reviewed all the placement of the trees that we're going to do on Shirley Street by veterans um, that we received the donation at the uh, spring forum night um, from the, the, all the donated trees for the, uh, you know, uh, David Green, Ramona Cooper uh, in their honor. So we're going to plant those trees. There's 15 of them that are going in additional. Um, 13 will be planted now. And the other two, there's a construction project going on in the building on the corner there, so we're going to hold off on that because there'll be some sidewalk work. The additional two will be planted once we locate those because we want to not block new building entrances and things like that. So, um, But that'll all be done well, um, probably in the next uh, month or so, and then you know, well before June. And then we'll have an event down there for the um, memorial bench um, that's going in at the corner there. So uh, we'll do probably another event. Uh, I think the 26 falls on a Monday this year, so we'll look to do something there as well. Um, in honor of them, uh, the, you know that that tragic event that happened in town. So uh, that's all I have. So if anybody has any follow-up questions, I'm certainly any questions. Council Munson. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Yep. Uh, I have a question about the uh, trees. Maybe uh, Mr. Kyle can answer. What kind of trees are they? Red maples. Red maples, and that is the recommended tree for the town for all public sidewalks. <laughs> it's certainly an accepted uh, street tree, uh, but that was the one that was. Requested by the donation. Right. Yeah. So the so when you said the tree warden, you didn't mention the tree committee. Are they involved in the process as well? They've been kept in the loop, but this was um, uh, worked out with the the you know the group that collected the money Great and, and the tree warden. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, Bob had suggested some locations, and I believe is that yep, the that same? was on a map that we looked at today, Gosh. and we marked them all out. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Within a few feet. Yeah. And the memorial bench, is that something that's through the memorial committee or the tree committee? Uh, it's already been ordered. Uh, it was in front of the council uh, before, uh, a, few, a few months ago. Our VSO uh, took care of that and moving forward. Great work. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Council Flockhart. Uh, thank you, uh, town manager. Yes. Uh, back to the ferry. Uh, is the MBTA involved with our ferry? Uh, not right now, no. Uh, we're still... Uh, we Trying to. Trying to, yep, but uh, n nothing yet, so I'm still working on that. And you um, hope that they'll be able to use the Charlie card on the ferry? Right now, we'll still use our current payment system, but again, that's all in process, so yeah. Um, we're going to talk about I understand that the ferry in East Boston, they're using the Charlie card. Uh, that, I'm not, that started up today, I think, or yesterday. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm not positive about that, but yeah. Uh, okay. um, but yeah, uh, and the other thing, nice piece on that ferry too is that what I didn't mention is we're talking to Massport and we'll look very close to adding, I think we'll have it done this week, they just needed some additional information, but adding a stop at the airport at the Hyatt there. So that'll be an additional stop this year that wasn't available before. So that should help some of our residents that work at the Logan and whatnot. So. Anything else? Thank you very much. CDICI has not met since nope. our last they meet meeting. Next week. Yes. All right. Old business. <clears throat> town council vote to transfer eighteen thousand from town attorney legal services line to the town attorney personnel line. Councillor Belcher. Thank you. Um, this passed unanimously, and this is mostly administrative to add a new line for town attorney personnel. Um, we previously used the line that is town attorney legal services to pay KP law and um, since we moved council in-house we need to pay from a personnel line all right this came out of committee with positive recommendation does not require a second any discussion on this motion See, yes one thing um, when that number was generated, uh, there was a little mix-up on the weeks, so we'll probably be back in another month or so oh, for just we, a few more dollars. It was discussed in committee that the yeah. numbers didn't The number didn't drive, yeah. I think I uh, forgot about the bi-weekly pay thing. It was, it's, anyway, it's, right. <laughs> it, it'll be adjusted. We'll be back That's with a little higher discussed. number, but I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. no, the ayes have it. Town Council Review Board of Appeals composition. We're going to hold that. Uh, yep, and just again, waiting to give it another couple weeks to get any other feedback from the committee. All right, yeah. thank you, Vice President. Flag policy, Council Ruggiero. Sure. Um, yep, so like I mentioned earlier, <coughs> the um, Rules and Ordinance Subcommittee um, came forward with the Three to nothing positive recommendation to approve the flag policy as presented in your agenda packets. Excuse me, I'm just trying to find my draft. Uh, I got it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I will um, read it. It's not that long, um, but yeah, I think I don't think I need a motion on this one. Um, motion that the town council adopt the following policy um, policy use of flagpoles on town property purpose the purpose of this policy is to establish guidelines for the display of flags on property owned by the town of Winthrop it is the policy of the town that flags should be displayed in conformance with federal and state policies as stated in the federal our flag publication of the United States Congress House document number 96-144 chapters 2 and 2a of the Massachusetts general laws Application. This policy applies to all flagpoles that are in, from time to time, may be in use on real property belonging to the town of Winthrop and under control of the town council and the town manager. Such flagpoles include, without limitation, those located at Town Hall, E.B. Newton School, French Square, and Miller Field. This policy does not apply to flagpoles on town property under the control of other public bodies, including those at the Winthrop Public Schools, which are governed by the school committee and the school superintendent. Paragraph 2, expression of official sentiment, not a public forum. Town flagpoles are not intended as a form for free expression by the public. Rather, the decisions of the town council or the town manager concerning which flags to fly in, when, and from which flagpoles are intended as an expression of official town sentiment. Flags permitted by the town council or the town manager may be flown from any town flagpoles, may or may not have some connection with groups using space on town property, but in each instance, the discretionary choice of the town council or the town manager to fly or not to fly a flag reflects the will of the town government, and no group or individual shall have the right to dictate that choice. Paragraph 3, American flag. During inclement weather, the flag of the United States... Uh, Except during inclement weather, excuse me, the flag of the United States shall be regularly flown during daylight hours from at least one flagpole at each town facility that has one or more flagpoles. It shall not be flown at night except when illuminated. It shall be flown at half staff whenever ordered by the President of the United States, the Governor of Massachusetts, or the town manager of the town to honor the death of a public officer. No flag or banner may be displayed above the flag of the United States, and no flag other than the POW MIA flag shall be displayed below the American flag on any town flagpole. The flag of the United States shall be flown in accordance with all applicable laws, including uh, 4 U.S.C. sections 1 through 10, 
Section 1 through 10. In the event of any cons inconsistency between such laws in this policy, <coughs> such laws shall take precedence. Paragraph 4, POW MIA flag. In accordance with Massachusetts Acts 1986, Chapter 399, Section 1, the POW MIA flag shall be regularly flown during daylight hours from a flagpole on the grounds of at least one town facility. Paragraph 5, other flags. The town flagpoles are not intended to serve as a form for free expression by the public. The following flags may be displayed on the community flagpole at the E.B. Newton School by the town as an expression of the town's official sentiments. Subsection A, flags displayed in conjunction with official events or ceremonies. By resolution of the town manager or proclamation of the town council, other flags may be displayed at the community flagpole at the E.B. Newton School. B, flags of local or professional sports teams. The town council may order the display of a professional or local sports team's flag to, fly, uh, to commemorate a significant achievement involving the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the town of Winthrop. C, flags displayed by proclamation. By proclamation of the town council, other flags may be displayed but not be displayed in place of the flag of the United States of America. No flag shall be displayed for more than 14 days on the community flagpole at the E.B. Newton School with the exception of the flag of the town of Winthrop. Paragraph 6, prior policies rescinded. All previous policies regarding town flags and flagpoles are hereby rescinded. This policy shall take effect upon adoption by the town council. And that did come out of committee with the unanimous positive recommendation. Correct. Correct. It yes. does not require a second. We'll have discussion on this if there is any. Councilor DeMarco. So when, when we originally, when I saw your original version of the flag policy, I, uh, I saw there were specific uh, events tied to that. That's not in the motion we got now. Oh. Okay. So, so yeah, because I, I, there were other events I wanted to add to that, but I don't have to do that at this time, correct? No. Okay. Councilor Aiello. Um, just sort of a little bit of a wording thing and then a clarification somewhat related to Councilor DeMarco's. Um, in 5A and C, we use the word by proclamation, and in B, we say that the town council may order, but in reality, it's every one of them is sort of a proclamation, right? They're all consistent. Correct. Yeah. That was the I think that's I think the that's, intent. Yeah. I, just yep, for yep. clarification, I think yep. that's the intent, so mm -hmm. I'm satisfied with that. Um, is it clear, again, related to what Councilor DeMichael said, what, what is the process for the council to hear a proclamation and to be presented and then voted on it? How, is there a, something in the rule book that sort of describes that process or someone just makes a motion at a meeting? Yeah. Um, and makes a proclamation. Along the agenda for the yep. following meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if somebody wants to... So if somebody in the community wants to sort of fly a flag, let's say for the Bruins or somebody, they can contact the council. We can then put it on the council agenda for the following meetings. Is that yep. the way it would work? I believe so, yeah. That's right. Yes, it's exactly okay. the way it would work. Right. I go back, just another point that Council Aiello made on 5B, how it says, you know, the town council made. And I think this goes back to a, a prior um, public comment, I guess, on town council versus town manager in, in this situation and this would be specific like say it's a, you know, a Bruins game to win the Stanley Cup and we, we haven't met or what, for whatever reason the town manager has the authority through this to raise that flag without us so that's it's you know we're not trying to create two chiefs here we're trying to give the opportunity to the town manager to do something if we had not had the opportunity to meet in that specific time but the vast majority of this should be coming from the council Councilor DeMarco. Uh, thank you, Council President. Yeah, um, I just think we need to be consistent. I mean, we're, we're talking about 14 days for certain events. Like, like I was looking at the calendar and just saying, like, okay, we can do 14 days for this. We can do 14 days for this. We can't be doing 14 days for one event and then five for another. We need to keep it all consistent so that way... You know, there's, there's no misjudgment. You know what I mean? It needs to be consistent. And because it's from the cultural center, and when I think of culture, that can be anything. That can be, you know, uh, uh, it could be a religion. It could be, it, it could be anything. Okay, so, I mean, it's almost like the rules of separation between church and state. 
don't apply in front of the cultural center because it's a cultural center. So I just want us to keep that in mind. Vice President Majero. I just want to say um, this has been a long time coming. And um, after the, the city of Boston case had concluded, KP at the time had emailed us saying that the one thing you shouldn't do is nothing. Um, they said you need a flag policy and you should get on it soon. And I think it took us a little bit longer to get there maybe than it should have, but we're here. Um, you know, I think that, yes, the precedent will be set as we kind of go forward with this. Um, and so, you know, precedent isn't necessarily a, a legal or an illegal thing. It's just precedent. So I think everybody's going to have to just kind of, um, you know, stick to their own um, beliefs or whatever have you as we go forward with this. But, um, you know, I, I think that we, we have a really good policy in front of us that um, takes elements from other flag policies across the country that have past muster. So I think that's definitely a positive thing here as well. Council, uh, Thanks, President. Um, I was hoping for a little more clarification. Uh, just in, in the event that someone wanted to propose something, they could call, uh, a citizen could call or email um, their counselor, their precinct counselor, or counselor at, um, at large, or just directly to an email to the um, town council. Uh, can you just clarify on that? And I have two other subsequent questions. Yeah, there's a town council email, or you can you know reach out individually. And so would they advocate for it, or just suggest it, and then that counselor would just go ahead, therefore, bring it to the attention of the, the whole council? Bring it to the attention, then it would have to you know get the necessary votes and everything else. I mean, right. not every council may agree, right? So. And so, to that effect, can you just clarify why it's not a freedom of speech issue? That's the shirtlift case. It cannot be. That was this is the guidance that you got by the shirtlift case. That's where Boston got in trouble. You know, it's not about the what the public wants to fly. It's about the sentiment of the town, and it's a town government decision, not a free speech issue. So, not every flag will be flown just because it's it's not a freedom of speech. Somebody could come forward, and the council says and doesn't get the votes, and the flag doesn't get flown. So it basically boils down to the sentiment of the actual council is that vote. Right. It, that, yep. so that and they could not even, just because it comes up in public comment or whatever, it doesn't necessarily, the council doesn't have to take it up. It's the, it's, the will of the, it's the will of the town government, you know, it's the sentiment of the town that way, as the elected body. And I do think that there is some room for divisiveness on this, and it could create some issues. If one flag, let's say we celebrate, let's say, you know, uh, this population is predominantly, you know, uh, of certain heritage. If we, if we raise the flags to celebrate their um, heritage, uh, then all of a sudden the other countries may. So it does start to, like, the, the second we start getting some requests, it will actually invoke more conversation and discussion because, like we said before, it creates a precedent as soon as one is accepted right. or denied. So it will be challenging at times to, to kind of see this through, but for the most part, we're following the, the federally recognized events that w will not be any surprise to anyone. Right. And most, if you look up the policy around flags, most of them are tied to the American flag, right? Most of the federal okay. holidays, other than Juneteenth, I think that's the only one that has its own flag, but everybody else is tied to the how you fly the American flag, whether it's at half, like Memorial Day, you know, half mass, and it gets raised, you know, those kind of things. So yeah, for the most part, those are all laid out. And, in terms of town Sounds morale summer. and uh, supporting our local schools and local teams, I think it would be a no-brainer to have, let's say, you know, the Viking, Viking flag pride. going yeah. as soon as we went, you know, yeah. as we're approaching the playoffs or, yeah. you know, something like that. But yeah. um, the other bigger stuff, uh, you know, there, do you have any flags already uh, that you have been proposed or suggested, or, or is this going to see as you see basis? As we go, I mean, we all, you know. Great, thank you. Councilor DeMarco. So, uh, Councilor Munson, I'm, I'm actually glad you went on this line of questioning because I was asking about the original holidays that I had saw in, in the original policy, and I was going to say, like, you know what? Well, then, you know, we if, if we're going to do Italian Heritage Month and raise the Italian flag, then we definitely have to raise the Irish flag for St. Patrick's Day and, and those two weeks. Um, I was thinking we have a strong Jewish community in this town. We should raise the Israeli flag for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you know. And and you know this would probably be the most controversial one, but raise the Christian flag for Christmas. You know what I mean? And and I'm ignorant on some of the other holidays, but I'm open 
like I would never vote against any other holidays. Like if there's a flag for Ramadan, raise it. You know what I mean? I'm all for it. Let's celebrate all cultures. When I was a kid, you know, we had a strong Jewish community. You know, we actually had Yom Kippur off. We, we actually didn't go to school on that day. And, you know, it's gotten to the point in society where, like, it's like, let's ignore all cultures. Okay, let's just ignore them. And it makes us ignorant. It makes us ignorant. I liked it when everybody celebrated everybody's culture, everybody learned about everybody. You know, I think that's the good stuff. I, I, I think learning about different cultures is so important. And now we ignore cultures. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think there's definitely a lot of flags we can raise and, and teach our children about, right. you know? Any other discussion? Vice President. One quick point that we brought up in a subcommittee that I didn't share during our, during my committee report. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, not every event or holiday or whatever have you has a flag. Um, and so I think one challenge to us as a council and the town manager as the town manager and all of our volunteer committees as volunteer committees is finding ways to, um, celebrate our, you know, our diversity here in town, for lack of a better term, um, through programming and, and events and, and things of that such. But, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, this is, this is definitely one step in that direction, but this isn't like a, a solve all. And in a lot of ways, it's a cop out, right? Um, it, you know, if we're just um, raising a flag with no sort of educational or, or programming um, surrounding it. So I that's just my opinion, but we, we referenced that in um, the subcommittee as well, so I want to make sure I brought it up here tonight. Great. Any other discussion? If not, there's a motion. It came out of committee with positive recommendation. Does not require a second. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. okay. Um, I will ask for a roll call vote for this. Councilor Honan? Yes. Councilor Pisillo? Council Munson? Yes. Council Belchup? Yes. Council DeMarco? Yes. Council Flockhart? Yes. Council Aiello? Yes. Vice President Ruggiero? Yes. President Letera? Yes. Thank you. All right, let's move on to solid waste ordinance. Let's stick with Vice President Ruggiero. Sure, so the solid waste ordinance has been with the council for a few meetings now. Um, This is a uh, five-pager. Yeah, this one you do not have to read. Yeah, I think there's a motion. No, read it, read it, read it. 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 Read just so to summarize, just as a reminder, this council voted to put this in an enterprise fund a year and a half ago. We voted to set a fee on this a year ago. Just about maybe my timeline's off. Um, what this does is that it codifies our solid waste and recycling curbside collection program into our book of ordinances. It gives deference to the town manager to set the fee, um, but he already has the the ability to do that through those prior motions, but it uh, more so formalizes that. It also gives deference to the town manager to um, uh, charge for overflow bags, right? I think this is the big change here, is that we're getting closer to an equitable system where you're gonna pay for the amount of trash that you produce. That is one of the changes here that is coming out of this. Um, <coughs> This also allows the town manager to privately negotiate with some of the rooming houses in town, the board in the housing authority. So that, that's what we're voting on tonight. We're not voting about a trash fee. We're not voting about an enterprise fund. The, the, we're voting on what's in front of us, which is, um, like I said, the, the big change here is the, um, the overflow bag policy, which will be implemented. So. So most people in town, this ordinance will not affect in any way, shape, or form. Uh, what it does, and again, just to, to clarify a little bit, when 
the previous town manager signed a trash contract that the contract stated that each household would be able to throw out one bag of trash one barrel of trash that was provided by the town uh, we have over the past two years been very lenient with that and given people the ability to try to you know you know the goal of this I think has always been and will be to reduce the amount of solid waste we throw out as a town um, so we we've enabled people over the past couple of years to throw out um, to re, to basically throw out in accordance with what you allowed to throw out, throw out what they wish. And so if it was two barrels, it was two barrels. If it was three barrels, we were still picking it up. Um, now, since we are halfway through the contract, we are trying to enforce the contract, which again, will help us to throw away less trash. Um, so, you know, and there are regulations set by the Board of Health and we have the chairman of the Board of Health with us. So if there's any questions, please feel free to speak up, Bill. But you know, part of the guidelines with the Board of Health is there are certain times when you could put out barrels. Barrels are to be of a certain thing, and the covers of these barrels are supposed to be able to close flatly, correct? Thank you. And that will continue under this policy. Um, and, and as the Vice President said, and thank Rules and Ordinance for all their work on this, and the Town Manager as well, and the Board of Health as well also. Uh, but this... Um, enables us to get to, a, again, a more equitable system. Uh, and again, I, I strongly believe that this will not affect, this specific ordinance will affect a few amount of people in this town. Along with this ordinance, there will be some sort of abatement process available, which we can talk more about also, which will give people the opportunity, again, to throw away less trash and maybe get a smaller barrel or such. Um, there will be certain abatements available. Um, but if there are questions, uh, and I'm sure there will be, questions on this, this again is coming out of committee, it has a positive recommendation, does not require a second. Uh, before I go to, to the council, I will ask the chairman of the Board of Health. Thanks, uh, Council President. I just want to uh, say that um, um, I had a pleasure working with both uh, the town manager and the ordinance committee to basically try to make sure that we're on the same page. And after you pass the ordinance, we will look at our regulation again just to make sure that they conform so that there's no confusion. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> now go to the council for questions. Or comments. Or comments. Uh, uh, Councilor Munson. I just want to say thanks. I, you guys put some solid work into it, and it's a, a nice piece of legislation, and I think that it's making our town more efficient. And I think that where the world is going, there's nowhere to put the trash. We need to reduce it. I think it's great. We're going to reduce our costs as a result. So, uh, thank you for your hard work, Councilor Demarco. So, um, this is kind of funny. I, um, when I was a kid, I got paid five dollars by my grandmother and my parents to take out the rubbish. That was my job, and it was usually like six or seven of those green trash bags that I had to just plop out front. And then we had, you know, then we had um, two and a half overrides left and right in the late 90s trying to, to do things. And one of them was actually, like, if you don't pass this two and a half override, there'll be no high school sports ever again at Winthrop. And the town actually said, no, we don't believe you, and voted no. And, of course, that's how the Viking Pride Foundation was formed. Then they itemized the two and a half override to include the trash fee. My understanding is that we still pay taxes towards our trash right now, correct? Yes, right now you right do. Right now you do. Yeah, so if we're paying taxes towards our trash. And you will continue and, to after this. This is not fully. Correct, trash. and you have a family of five in one house, and you have a family of two in another house. They're essentially paying for the same barrel and the same recycling bin, correct? Based on that, I can't vote positively for this. Okay, Councillor Flockhart. Uh, just to build on what you've said, I live in a 106 unit building. Mm -hmm. I pay taxes too, to mm -hmm. all of this. I have private trash collection, as does every other building in this town that has more than uh, three units. 
So we're yeah. all paying the taxes, but they yeah. for lots of things. Vice President Majero. I just want to reiterate, we're not voting on a trash fee tonight. Right. Right. You already voted on that yeah. a year and a half ago. I don't remember the vote count, but we already voted on that. It's already in an enterprise fund. We already voted on the trash fee. So that, that's not what the vote is about tonight. So I don't want to weaponize this and make this a political lightning rod. Like that, that, That's not what this is. That, that vote already happened. So th this is completely separate, and this is just adding a layer to it that will make it more equitable so that you are now going to have to pay more for the amount of trash that you produce. And I think that's, that's, that's the path that maybe we want to get on. This is basically enforcing the contract that was signed with two capital. years ago with a caveat to give people the opportunity to continue to throw away more than was allotted by the contract. If we vote this down tonight, everyone's still going to get a trash fee next year. It's not like we're saving the, the, the trash fee for this. That, already, that vote already happened. Councilor Belcher? I was just going to reiterate what the Vice President said and what the President mentioned. This isn't a vote for the fee that this just codifies what we're already what we already have in practice um, and the feedback I've gotten often from constituents is that they don't think it's equitable that their neighbors throw out twice as much trash as they do and they're paying the same fee so that eradicates that issue this policy takes care of that. and hopefully with the abatement policy yeah. we'll give um, people maybe and I'm not distinguishing, but maybe seniors that throw away less trash, mm -hmm. the opportunity to get a smaller size barrel. Um, you know, the goal is to throw away less. And and I will say, and I do I do want to say, and I've asked um, the town manager and the DPW director who is here with us to to give me a little flow chart, which I'm going to expand a little bit and, and share with the council over the next week or so, which just gives us a, a recap of the tonnage that we use on a monthly basis and the prices that we're paying. Um, and it's it's really incredible. And, and it's incredible to look at the fluctuation in prices, for example, of recycling that, you know, a year and a half ago was at $11.67 a ton, and today is $115.33 a ton. And these are very variable. But I, I do want to say that during these past two and a half years of enacting this, this, this was a major change for the town. This is something brand new. This was groundbreaking. And I want to thank Steve Calla and his crew in the DPW uh, and now the Trash Enterprise Fund uh, for really making this a relatively seamless transaction. It, it's, this was a major deal, and, and I want to thank you. Um, you know, there were all sorts of concerns at the beginning as to what this was going to do and how it was going to affect the appearance of the town and this, that, and the other thing. But, um, you know, there's been bumps, just like we said earlier, nobody and nothing is infallible, but uh, the bumps have been minor. And, and again, I think a lot of it's to the guidance of Steve, so I thank you for that. Um, and I thank you for this um, transparency in, in terms of the tonnage that is being thrown out. And you could see a decrease in tonnage, too. Um, and I think that's just the learning process. Um, but again, don't want to belabor. Any further discussion on the um, change in the ordinance? Seeing that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilor Honan. Yes. I'm sorry, Councilor Pisello. Councilor Council Belcher? Yes. Council Flocka? Yes. Council Aiello? Yes. Council DeMarco? No. Vice President Ruggiero? Yes. President Lachery? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the committee handbook was somehow put on the agenda, but it's, we, it's we did handle this at the last <laughs> meeting. Yes. Council Belcher wants to read the whole thing. <laughs> 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 I will read that. The, uh, <laughs> the, the next two items. Uh, going to keep a place on the agenda, and that is the Winter Beach Access Points and the MBTA uh, review as to uh, as to the route, the route in Winthrop and how it might be able to be changed slightly to be safer uh, for our community. And, and um, I did talk with Representative Turco today, who is now in the process of helping us out with both of these in terms of um, given us the ability to have representation here in very short order. We were hoping to have somebody uh, at this meeting and uh, 
schedules seem to be tied up when we call so hopefully maybe you go a little higher and maybe the schedules free up a little bit so we hope to have representation here uh, especially on the beach project on the beach access I just don't want to wait until July 4th to say we still don't have access to some points on the beach so and we had been promised this at the end of last summer that this issue would be addressed so we will keep on that uh, yes, if I, uh, uh, Councillor Ayala. Just a point, in the, and my information may not be uh, accurate, but um, I ran into a former member of the Conservation Commission who <coughs> said that when um, all of that sand and rocks were brought into the Sorry. beach, yep. that DCR committed in, a, in a, an agreement with the town of Winter for 10 years of maintenance uh, is baked into that agreement and that DCR has not followed through. So I don't know if we can dig up that agreement between us and DCR that allowed the, the all that forward. work to the, yeah. do there, but that um, the person said that DCR is in clear violation of their contractual obligation to maintain that beach. Yep. So, Councilor Aiello, I can tell you um, I, saw, so I, I saw them doing work on Winter Beach th uh, this week. So I don't know what if it's consistent yeah with the, exactly the contract. Yeah. yeah yeah thank you uh town council evaluation forms employees and vendors this is the um committee on commit former committee on committees um council Belcher, this is still in committee correct uh we we met on the 27th and fine-tuned the goals that are going to be included on the evaluations and they are ready to come out to the council for feedback i'll get those out by the end of day tomorrow um, we're asking for council feedback by the 14th that'll give the committee a couple weeks to put it all together and then meet with um, the town manager and town clerk for the evaluations. Thank you. New business, I have one appointment I'd like to make that the town council accept the, nom the appointment made by town council president Letary to appoint Debbie Chavez to the scholarship committee for a term to expire for the remainder of a term vacated. Uh, the term would expire on June 30th, 2024. Um, is there a motion? Motion. Motion by yeah. Councilor Boucher, second by Councilor DeMarco. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Congratulations, Debbie Chavez, on the scholarship committee. Um, and I've already contacted Mary Lou Osborne, who does an incredible job with that committee, and she is well aware of this and has contact information for Debbie, so Debbie can hit the ground running. My next door neighbor, you know, I'm going to hear a lot of, <laughs> uh, right? Public comment number two. Anybody on Zoom? No. Anyone in the audience? Uh, public relations. Does this, does the rabies clinic just stay on the agenda? Yep. Because I feel like I've talked way too often. April 29th, 2023, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, the annual rabies clinic at the Old Middle School Auditorium. And the senior work off program applications are available at the senior center uh, until April 7th, so shortly. Um, Councilor Honan? Yeah, I'd just like to remind everybody not to throw their textiles in the trash. There are textile bins. Um, there's one at DPW. Uh, there's one at the basketball courts near the Pillar House. Is there a third one or the, just the landing. public landing? Public landing. So please, if you have any textiles, don't throw them in the trash. Bring them to the dumpsters. Thanks. There's also two new public gardens. Uh, oh, bring that up. all right. One at the town hall and the other one down at the high school on Jason Street. All right, book drop-offs. So don't Ooh. throw your books in the trash. <laughs> yeah. Recycle books. There's one right, right around the corner here up by mm -hmm. the door. And then what's the other one? Uh, the uh, Payson Street. Payson oh. Street near no. the high school. There's also a bin behind the FKO. Get recycled. Uh, that's just for like on the air mm -hmm. as opposed to throw away. Yeah. Better than throwing them in the trash. Yeah. Council yeah. Yes, uh, yes. In case you guys missed the uh, last blood drive and you wanted to donate, you can save some lives by donating your blood on April 11th at the Odd Fellows Hall at 196 Winthrop Street. You can look it up on redcross.org. Council Belcher. Uh, just a reminder that you can donate to the Rona Mail Town Scholarship and any time by sending a check to the tax collector's office payable to the Town of Winthrop indicating Rona Mail Town Scholarship on the memo line. Councilor DeMarco. Uh, flag football in Winthrop starts up on April 15th. So um, fun times at Miller Field are here again. Um, I don't have to worry about losing the Councilor's Cup. 
because you're out as a coach. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. My so, but no, cool. yeah, but get down and watch some uh, some fun. It, it's it's really fun. It's really a, a fun family oriented event. So get down. And when is that? Starts April fifteenth. Thank you, Council Aiello. Uh, April 29th and thirtieth, the Winter Five Council is holding their annual spring uh, arts event at the E.B. Newton School. Council Flockhart. I have nothing. Vice President Ruggiero. I was going to wait until next week, but everybody else had something, so I guess I'll pitch this two weeks in a row, um, or two meetings in a row. On Sunday, May 7th at Deer Island, Winark will have its annual Winark run, walk, and roll around the island um, to support individuals and families in our communities with physical and developmental disabilities. Um, this is a great annual event. Uh, we have some great sponsors this year, as we always do. But if anyone is around and would like to attend, you can buy a ticket online. Um, th the link is consistently posted on the Winark Facebook page, but I will get a more appropriate link to the clerk for next week's agenda. But uh, great time next Sunday, May 7th, 10 a.m., Deer Island. Thank you. But no other business before the council. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Uh, one more quick thing. I'd like to. I'm sorry, Council President. Um, I just would like to wish everybody a blessed Passover and a ble and a great Easter. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. There's a motion to adjourn by Council Belcher, second by Council Aiello. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Thank you.